He also made very inexpensive desk accessories so that the public could have bits of Louis Comfort Tiffany design. This is a picture frame. He made many desk accessories in different patterns. This one was called Cornflower. There, there was another called Grape that was very popular. I think Cornflower is rather pretty, and I've been very nepotistic, and that's a picture of my mother and uncle in 1912, in the <laughs> only, only 102 years ago. And there you see his Byzantine, his Byzantine desk set. You know, men, businessmen were very proud of their desk sets, and their inkwells and their desk sets represented their position in the corporation. And this, the Louis Comfort Tiffany produced a great many of them. The Byzantine one, which was first shown in Paris in 1906, exactly the same year as that beautiful jadeite analogous necklace was shown. This was, I think, the most beautiful and most elaborate of those desk sets, which really told what a pecking order in a corporation was in those days. And there you have his first model for the inkwell. And of course, in a way, the inkwell was more symbolic than anything else in a desk set. And here is his first model for the Byzantine desk, desk set inkwell. And you can be happy to know that also belongs to you. And here I'm just going to show you some of these inkwells to give you an idea of what big businessmen wanted on their desk to show their prestige and their high level of taste. So here are a number of the type of inkwells that you might have seen, lamp or, or, or clocks on office, office mantelpieces or office sideboards were also a sign of great prestige. This is a very unusual one done in mosaic um, with a little bit of Egyptian motif on the base, as you see again. I think this one's wonderful. This was a, undoubtedly a rather wealthy businessman that had this one with the colored mosaics and the bronze fish. And this very rare, there are almost no hand-carved Louis Comfort Tiffany wooden pieces. It's one of the only ones we know. And there again are his beloved scarabs on that one. This I've always been amused by <coughs> because he simply cast a blue crab in bronze and let it hold a plain oyster shell as the top of the inkwell. But what a wonderful object it is. It's incredibly satisfying, but I mean, maybe the most extreme example of using something totally worthless to create a wonderful object. An oyster shell is not a thing of great value. This, I tell you, it's downstairs. Um, I, I, I wish we could make it even bigger so you could see the Liburnum lamp. But this window with the grape and lemon window that is the, the one that I mentioned a little bit earlier that I, I hope when you go downstairs you will look at it very, very carefully and ask yourself the question, how on earth could all those pieces of glass be created so perfectly to fit into the design and how many hours and people did it take people to find the precise movement of the design in the glass, the precise colors to produce this window. It's hard to see there, but believe me, it, it is worth your scrutiny when you go downstairs. It is an absolute miracle. Um, some of his other lamps, again, showing what simple things, such as lily pads he used. It's a very sophisticated and beautiful Tiffany lamp. This, again, belongs to you, the Woodbine lamp. It has a wonderful variety of color and wonderful variety of texture and density to the glass. It's, um, <coughs> it's on the poster, so I think you know it well, but it's worth a look, too. It's a very, very beautiful one. And here again, of course, there has to be a peacock lamp. That's Louis Comfort Tiffany, so you're going to have peacock feathers in the lampshades. Now, an interesting thing is, I was saying to some people before this that we have photographs of many pieces of Louis Comfort Tiffany jewelry using Native American arrowheads. And we have never been able to locate one. We have put ads in magazines. We have many photographs of them. Somehow, all the Louis Comfort and Tiffany jewels using Native American arrowheads have disappeared. So again, if you have a piece of jewelry, 
using antique Native American arrowheads. We'd be very happy to hear about it. But you see here he has used Native American basket design um, in his lampshade. So it's quite a departure from Japanese woodblock print design or Neo-Egyptian design or peacock feathers or just des designs based on American flora. But to look at our Native American design and come up with this wonderful lampshade and <coughs> this magnificent example, which is also in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then he did mosaics in the same idea. And so this one belongs to you. So you do have an example of Louis Cumbertippi's use of Native American patterning and color. And if you'd like to give us your arrowhead jewelry to go with it, we will not object at all. <laughs> This, this shows one of his pieces, types of glass called turtlebacks in the middle of this that was immensely popular. These were panels that would have probably gone around the waistcoating in your white marble entrance hall, or they might have gone on the front of an altar in a church. He decorated many churches. It's, it's, this belongs to you as well, and got me into a little trouble with the Metropolitan Museum because they said, no, it should belong to them, and I said, no, it should belong to the KIA, and that is it. <laughs> and please look, you'll have to look really carefully, but above the small door, you see the crucifixion, and then there's a small wooden door, and immediately above that door on the left-hand side, you will see the panel that I just showed you in the Tiffany workshops. And then next to that, you will see two panels in a single square that are all three of those two panels and the single square also belong to you. One of them is in the show downstairs. But it's interesting to see, you see there are his workmen working, this man probably on the front of an altar for a church. But all of these mosaic patterns were used in domestic interiors, religious interiors, institutions, and they were very, very popular at the time. I, I, I think it's wonderful that Vicky found um, a photograph showing three pieces that belong to you, where they originally came from. And actually, the two tall panels were the very lumpy um, pieces of glass, which he called jewels he at one time had in the windows of his showroom on Madison Avenue. So he thought he thought very, very highly of them. And I think you'll see when you see the one downstairs the reason he thought highly of that. And there you see some of those <coughs> patterns. It's a whole row of, of patterns that you could order. It's a kind of sample book of Louis Cumberland Tiffany's Mosaic Enterprises. These were his personal samples. And they're what 13, 14 different, 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 different um, borders. And I think it also just shows first it's a very beautiful object, but also shows the invention that he could come up with one after another of highly original and you know, really beautifully thought out and beautifully colored patterns to be inlaid into in domestic or religious interiors. He also, as I said, went in for ceramics. I, I'm, I'm going to go through these a bit clearly. And again, you see they are all based on, on flora, on the observation of rather simple flowers and plants. That I think is a wonderful thing. You see it's something so simple as a fiddlehead fern, what he has turned it into on the right, and uh, Jack in the pulpit on the left. And in the middle, we have simple corn. So he could take, you know, skunk cabbage and fiddlehead ferns and corn and jack of the pulpits and turn them into perfectly magnificent sculptural objects. And very American, there is no precedent of this type of, of sculpture and ceramic in any other country. But it was highly, highly original. That's what he could do with a mushroom, not so bad. And here, here is an example, I'm not sure what flower that is, but this is an example of one of these ceramic cores that has been copper plated. It has not yet been enameled, so I'm just showing it to you to show some of the process from what you saw of those um, raw ceramic cores, now electroplated, and then it would have been enameled and fired. Uh, you know, weaving, 
leading to two ways of producing um, much more modern merchandise than would have been possible in the 19th century. Um, <coughs> sometimes his glass was combined by Tiffany and Company with, with jewels, and these are ladies' um, fragrance, fragrance flasks. They were shown, all three of this were shown in Paris at the Paris Exposition of 1900, and the one at the back you have downstairs. There's the most elaborate one shown in 1900. But ladies actually carry these in their purses. I would not advise you to do that today. But, <laughs> yep. well, let's get back there. Yep. And here, here again is an example of how his, um, his father's company in 1900 was so proud of what he was doing, they took this beautiful fabric glass vase and had the jewelry shops at Tiffany and Company mounted with mermaids and seahorses to show in 1900. I'm not sure how pleased Louis Comfort Tiffany was with that effect because the designer Pauline Farnham, who did the mountings for it, when Louis Comfort Tiffany took over as design director, that was the end of Pauline Farnham. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm going to end there. We've been talking about his peacock feathers and his quest for beauty and his quest for perfection in things. And I think this is one of the most, if maybe not the most perfect example of how you get a peacock feather into a piece of glass. So I'm going to leave you with that perfectly beautiful image. And I hope you've learned a little bit about Mr. Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you.